Our next talk, talk is from um, Sally, who has uh, kindly uh, come to speak to us today about um, websites being the symptom of the cause. Is that the right? That is right, yeah, well, uh, well read the title. Um, yeah, so hello, I'm Sally, uh, I'm on Twitter, if anybody wants to say hello. Um, just to introduce myself very briefly, I started off uh, basically, I spent the best uh, part of 10 years agency side, working as a developer originally, and then up to head of technology. And I left that world at the end of 2012 to start an independent service giving technology agnostic advice. So I now run a little digital transformation consultancy based in East Anglia, so it is nice to almost quite literally be on home turf, sort of, um, but my clients are all over. And it's this idea of kind of transformation and change that I want to talk to you about today. So it kind of ties quite nicely in with what Tom was saying a little bit. But what I want to talk about is um, using websites as a starting point for triggering that change. But to kick off, I want to show you why websites can be important in that way. And unfortunately, there's another little uh, repeat of the political thread that we saw. Uh, because I want to talk a bit about the Affordable Care Act, or Obamacare, which is still a hot topic. And there's obviously been a lot of talk about this over the last couple of years. And amongst all the commentary, I started noticing phrases like this, even in post-election news stories from people on different sides of the argument. So amongst all the you know, controversy and protests and announcements, I was still pretty amazed that people were bringing up website issues from 2013 in the same breaths as talking about the impact of the act itself. And I'm not sure how much you know about it, I'm not going to bore you, but it's safe to say that there were actually some issues. But for some, the previous website issues had become a reason to resent and politicise the act itself, even all these years later. So at the time, there were actually problems cited with the strategy and the running of the project and the way that they <coughs> approached the website. But as you can see from those snippets from the articles, people don't tend to think in terms of specifics. They just associate it with the website or even the scheme itself. And so when websites have problems, people really remember. And if certain people consider something a failure, it doesn't actually matter if other people don't. Because you can get things like um, negative association being continued by Google. So you can see if you start to type in Affordable Care Act webs, you get negative suggestions coming back. And you find that these kind of swells of opinion can start to influence the world around you, which is all part of this uh, fake news phenomenon. And it's so bad that when I first put this talk together, uh, Googling website failure would bring up, you probably can't see at the back, but there are basically references to the Affordable Care Act and healthcare.gov uh, here and down there. And then down the bottom of the page, there's one there, and they've got it in the images, they've got it in people also ask, and in the searches related, so it's all over. And I wanted to update this, so I checked the other week whether it's still true, and yes, it is still true, it's still up there. But you might notice that obviously House of Fraser hasn't been having a very good time recently, so you know, they've kind of started to push a bit of the Obamacare stuff out. But how many of you, off the top of your head, can think about a website project that's gone wrong, whether it's yours or somebody else's? Because I know I can. And digital projects are really notorious for this. Um, failure can mean everything from companies going bust through to that really annoying thing where somebody redesigns their website and everybody hates it, and then six months later, they redesign it again and everybody hates it again and says the last one was so much better. So there's different degrees. <laughs> But this is actually human nature, and apparently we as a species are incredibly negative. And there's a very interesting paper uh, called Bad is Stronger Than Good by all those people down there. And it discusses how, um, as humans, our negative emotions are stronger across things like our first impressions, our memories, our relationships, and our feedback. Um, so try to be kind when you're you know, tweeting about these talks later. Um, but if anybody's ever given you criticism and praise at the same time, you tend to take the criticism to heart more. You tend to forget the good things. And so this natural inclination that we have to hone in on the bad can actually be used to help us make better things. Because when a project fails, very often the website can act as this focal point for criticism. And they're a fantastic public magnifying glass for all of the issues that have caused projects to get to the point of having problems. And the great thing about that is that we can kind of flip it on its head, and we can use that magnification 
ourselves to understand some of the broader factors that might need addressing to make everything better. So where we may sometimes um, make things with the end goal of just you know, getting them out there, putting them on the web, I'd like to talk to you today about the idea of actually using websites as a starting point. So not just to make websites, but to use websites to point you in the direction of everything else that could be better, and using them as a tool for change and to improve frustrations in the world around us. So there's different stages we're going to look at. Uh, you see, I, I wrote these before I actually knew that we were going to be here, and so uh, I was just thinking it's kind of a bit of a game of two halves, but that sounds so cliche, given where we are, <laughs> but it actually is. Um, and so the first bit is identifying what we could change, uh, how we get to that point, and the second half is um, how we make things better. So at each step, we're just going to look at a couple of activities um, that you can hopefully take away and use, but the slides are going to be online later, or you can come and grab me if you want to talk about anything in more detail, because there's a lot that we can potentially get through. So, step one, identifying issues. And this is all about finding out what could be better, using the website as a lens. So, the, the way that we can see this is when uh, everybody hates websites, you know, the old one was thrown out, you get a new one brought in that's built with completely new, different, shiny technology by completely different teams, but then eventually suffers the same fate as the old ones. And things happen that you know maybe don't go to plan, or everybody promises those, those things that happened before, they're not going to happen again, but they do. And because we're negative humans, and bad is stronger than good, we focus on the bad stuff. So I wonder if any of these are familiar to you. Uh, these are the things that people in boardrooms who were never previously involved in projects freak out over and fire people. And they're all symptoms of things that somewhere aren't quite right. And so yeah, they totally need fixing, but the real question is why they happened in the first place. So we want to flip everything around to be much more proactive and to stop any of these things happening at all, which is what we're going to talk about in the second half. But the first step is very much to kind of to gather these symptoms together to help us to diagnose the problem. And one way to do that is expert reviews. And these kind of do what they say on the tin a little bit. So they're a chance to look over a site with a critical expert eye. And on my projects, there's very often an existing site, a site that we can use as a starting point. And I use this as a prompt to have wider conversations. And you might find that expert reviews are quite common as part of project processes. Um, so you'll usually find that they're done by UX team members, and they might focus on things like usability and heuristics. But this can help us up to a point. Um, what we can find, though, is if we put our developer detective hats on, they can actually work a bit harder for us. So these are some of the areas that I tend to focus on. Um, things like... Uh, content, performance, accessibility, code review, responsive approach, third party integrations, for the benefit of people at the back, because I know that's quite small. Um, the goal with this is to give us a really good high level view of where there might be that kind of underlying rot in some places. So what's good and what's bad. And we want to find the symptoms that are most acute. And there's so many tools that you can use for this. Everybody's made some fantastic stuff over the recent years and um, Google recently released this poster as well uh, to try and encourage people to think about performance whether they're developers or, or senior management and I've got a collection of reference points that I tend to use which is on GitHub and it's very broad which is intentional uh, I'm also writing a, a 12 months of digital transformation kind of series of blog posts where I'm going to cover reviews later in the year but you're going to have to wait for that I'm afraid because uh, it's not just done to quite yet um, but what I also really like is that some of these tools that are in my checklist are also themselves quite broad. So um, this is a screenshot of what was the Chrome Canary Lighthouse extension, but it's now in DevTools. And um, the focus for this is very much uh, what it was originally meant to be a progressive web app checklist, but it actually covers a great deal of stuff, um, including things like accessibility and performance as well. So you can use it to get this nice high level view of how something's faring. And whilst I've got this set of um, things I tend to refer to, so checklists and, and tools that can help, it's also really important to keep in mind that a lot of these things are very subjective and everybody's different. So you need to use tools, but also apply your expert knowledge. Uh, this is why it's an expert review, not just a cookie cutter one. 
because, for instance, sites that use a lot of Angular tabs, if you run them through a validator, it might look terrifying, but not actually be a problem. So you need to sort of have that expertise to know what you should and shouldn't care about. And likewise, your human eyes uh, can sometimes spot issues that validators won't. Um, and when I first wrote this talk, I kept coming back to, um, in 2013, uh, sorry, 2015, Ryanair relaunched their website. And it was one of those classic times where something goes live and immediately the internet thinks they could have done better. So Twitter was, you know, all over it, talking about how slow it was and how heavy all the pages were and all that kind of stuff. And uh, Tim Cadillac noticed something in the source code, uh, which was posted in the flurry of tweets, which basically says, preloader spinner is in here and it's not a directive for AngularJS rendering, time being absurd long. So obviously somebody knew that stuff wasn't quite right, but you know, it's just out there anyway. So as part of our reviews, we want to hear these stories. We want to know what people know about and maybe the reasons behind them and find out their frustrations and collect them together. Because at this point, you want to get to that point where you've got a collection of things that could maybe be better and then maybe grouped into different pots. And you should try and find out which ones are causing um, the most acute problems or where you've got the most problems. And that's great, that's a starting point for you. But the really interesting thing starts to be when you peel back those layers and try to diagnose why you're getting problems in those areas. Because we're after the root causes. And there's a couple of really good ways of doing this. The first uh, comes from Mr. Sakichi Toyoda, who you might know um, from founding Toyota, and he's invented stuff. And he also came up with a technique called the five whys. And the idea here, as any uh, parent of small children will know, is that when you face a problem, endlessly asking why can bring you to different results, basically. So um, it's quite a, a common uh, thing that you use within lean methodologies. And you can apply it to your development, too. So let's assume that one of the tools that we used um, to check something has flagged that we've had really, really massive images. And if we apply the five whys technique, we can see what we get out of that. So we set out a problem statement, which is large images are causing performance issues. Why? Because they're not being optimized. Why? Because it's a manual process and nobody's doing it. Why? Because they're not quite sure what's needed. Why? Because there's no references to look at. Why? Because nobody asked the agency to provide documentation, or Tom just didn't decide to do it because he doesn't like doing documentation. And there could easily have been other root causes, um, you know, things like they're not having been a performance budget set, or designers not being aware of the impact of putting massive images all over the page. But essentially, what starts off as being a technical problem is actually a communication issue. And we'll come back to this in a sec. There's another method that's quite similar to this, um, which is Ishikawa or fishbane diagrams. And rather than being a really linear set of events and those you know, tracing back the individual whys, um, instead here you try and frame a problem by looking at it through different lenses, each of which might have different causes. And so the categories that you're gonna pick will be um, dependent on your specific situation. But what the idea is, again, is to essentially kind of find out the reasons why something is happening. And as with the expert review, this is a technique that very often gets used on projects. So you might be familiar with this already, just in a different capacity. And what I want to stress with this is that these kind of techniques don't just have to be for UX or product purposes, and we can actually use them to help our development processes too. So by tracing back uh, the root causes of why our code base has ended up with so many dependencies or why our bills keep breaking. And when you've done this a few times, it's likely that you'll start to notice a few patterns. And at the root, you can very often boil down um, everything that's happening quite simply into four categories. And the first of those is people, which isn't a surprise really because we are quite uh, tricky things to manage. So people is our customers, it's the people making sites, it's the business stakeholders, it's basically everybody who is involved or who could be. And we're great at harping on about users, but we're really quite bad at thinking a little bit closer to home. And there's a big, big difference between a website that's having performance issues because a developer's maybe early in their career and they haven't been taught about techniques that might be able to help, 
you know, things like service workers or the potential for HTTP2. And there's somebody who cares hugely, they're a complete expert, they know everything there is to know, but their time is being cut in half and they're cutting corners just to get the job done. So both of these are actually people problems, but one is a developer who needs nurturing, and the other one's an organisation who perhaps needs to think a bit more about how they're looking after their developers. Now, technology is a really interesting one, and it's kind of the root of a lot of uh, what my projects do, because um, when it's not in place, you can have issues, but when it's in place and isn't quite right, you can also have issues. And you might be seeing symptoms occurring because of a particular technology choice. So, say your accessibility sucks. That could be because the CMS that you're using um, doesn't handle alt tags very well, or it might be spewing out all kinds of terrible markup. And we can maybe hack around with the product and perhaps fix it for ourselves. If we're feeling nice, we might release that back into the community. But that doesn't actually address things like why that technology was chosen in the first place and how we got to that point, how we can make better decisions into the future. Because when we make decisions, we really need to do so with a plan and a vision in mind and work both tactically and strategically. So why are we doing something? and how will we evolve, of the, yeah, evolve over time. I really like, um, when you start to look at stock imagery and look at the details, basically this guy has just got a tablet with some generic grass on and B is the title. And you think, can they not you know, do something a bit more realistic than that? But apparently not, or maybe that is the decision that you know, people are making these, uh, sort of, well, it's the information people are making the decisions on. So many of the issues that manifest in websites can be traced back to strategic issues rather than just being mistakes. And if there's not very good leadership around it, then you might keep having problems. You might see these repeating issues coming up again and again. And I really love this example that I saw on Twitter a while back, uh, which is an interesting strategic approach to solving a tech problem, because um, you probably won't be able to see. It's basically the FedEx office website, and uh, it's an error message that comes up when you get part way down the line that says we apologise for the inconvenience but it looks like your browser no longer supports Flash. And instead of maybe changing their website so that they don't require their customers to have Flash, instead what they're doing uh, is they say it's a thank you for your patience and being a valued FedEx office customer. Please use this discount code at the checkout to receive $5 off orders over $30. So yeah, interesting strategy. You can either fix your technology or you can just try and bribe your customers I guess. <laughs> And process. So this can be the process that you make or do something, or the processes involved um, in the product itself. So for instance, the steps that need to be taken for somebody to make and confirm a booking. And processes are very often taken at face value. And it's very good to question everything. And just to highlight this, one of my earliest clients uh, were Further Education College. And they had a website, and I was brought in to improve their online application process. And so we started to map that out and look at the technology in place, and what we could optimise. But it became really apparent that actually that wasn't where the issues were. It was everything else that happened around it. And so when students applied online, they actually uh, had a process that ended up in you know people printing stuff off internally in the college and faffing around with it. And then when the students came um, for interviews or to enrol, they had to bring in documents, they had to refill in forms by hand because none of the information was duplicated. And really importantly, uh, when it came to the point of actually enrolling, they had to go and get a sticker. And we kept coming back to this idea of a sticker, which everybody was talking about in these sort of revered terms. And I just couldn't understand why this was such a you know, sacred thing, sacred element that everybody felt so important. And it turned out that um, throughout time, basically, the college had traditionally had a book containing stickers. And so you would get a form. When you accepted onto a course, they would hand over the sticker to you, which signified, yes, you are accepted officially. And in terms of stock management, they had one less. So when the book ran out of stickers, they had no more places left. And there's absolutely no reason why we couldn't digitize that. And you know, it, it did not matter. There was no you know, secret security in it or anything like that. It was just a sticker. But it's because it's kind of um, you know, had this air of importance around it 
that nobody ever questioned whether it was something they could really get rid of. And so actually by removing all of these manual elements, including the sticker, we'd get rid of a load of stresses and you know, physical bottlenecks of trying to get people in rooms, data capture, um, handwriting issues, consistency issues, and all these headaches they'd had. So sometimes the things that we think are really, really crucial, and we might talk about as being really important, are exactly the things that we can cut out. So trying to think a little bit wider, thinking beyond websites as being just interfaces that we, we you know, directly interact with, and thinking about everything else that goes on around them is what I want to talk about next. Because web technologies no longer just mean public marketing websites. And things like Electron mean that there's no longer even necessarily a URL tied to web development anymore. So we can start thinking beyond the browser into virtual worlds or even the physical world through IoT. So we can build so much now using web technologies that doesn't just have to mean a website in a browser. And I think that sometimes we forget how cool the technology we get to work with every day is. And in so many respects, we are actually already in the future. And we need to be mindful of this, because as much as we want to make things better now, we want to fix our immediate problems, we should also keep an eye on the potential, what we could do in the future, and planning for how we will work. And a lot of the websites that I run are actually about challenging people to push themselves that little bit further. Because this isn't just about customers either, it's not just about the public and the consumers and you know, tech adoption there. But it's actually about how you want to work, how you can work smarter, and what technology can do for you. A lot of the people that I tend to work with have a digital team, and it is just focused on outputting websites, solving problems, you know, creating software. But they miss out on loads of cool ideas there. So I really want to challenge people to try and think a bit more about working for themselves as well. <coughs> So, so far we've focused on websites helping us um, to fix broken stuff, um, just leading them um, to the deeper issues that need resolving. But we don't just want to think about being affected negatively. So as in you know, replacing the sticker, we can dig into these root causes a bit more to apply digital change um, for more positive reasons. And this is where you start to move into your actual relationship with technology, with the web, with the, you know, the software itself. And it's about being proactive. So we want to think about what potential lives, uh, what potential benefits to lives we can actually bring. So you know, whether that's catching criminals or curing cancer or anything else. And one of my favorite projects I've worked on to date was actually with the Mana Racing Formula One team, who are sadly no longer with us, but that was nothing to do with me. And uh, this project wasn't anything to do with the public website at all. It was about looking underneath the very traditional team processes and identifying areas where digital technologies and the web could do more to benefit the team on and off the track. So we started looking at the operations side of things, which is um, basically a very traditional manufacturing process. So requests come in that start, and that might be we've run out of nuts and bolts, or it might be that uh, you know, something's broken on the track, or um, they also had an aerodynamics team, which were all about um, you know, looking, can we shave a millimetre off the front wing to make the car go faster? And so you get those requests captured, and then they go through quite a linear process of um, being signed off, and then you want to update the master car records, uh, which is a bit like a kind of pattern library for the car. And then you need to procure the parts, receive the uh, parts, then they might be assembled or inspected. And then eventually they go into stores and potentially out to the racetrack. So very linear, very high pressure, and incredibly cost and time critical. And our goals were basically to do all of these things to make the manufacturing process and to help the team. But actually, if you swap out the kind of you know, car-related terms, and the manufacturing terms, these could be goals from any web project. So what we were trying to do was look for things that we'd um, do to make a web project better and to make a digital team great, but to apply these to more traditional environments. Thank you. Um, so on the MANA project, um, with these sections of the process, uh, we, we did things that were difficult. So we would map out the steps the roles involved, the systems, the flow of data, the attributes we're dealing with, and we did all things like speaking to people about common frustrations. 
So very, very similar to things that you probably do day to day. And from this, we were able to compile a list of pain points and crucially the gaps, the areas of opportunity. And when you've mapped things like this out, then you can start to think back to how does this relate to those root causes? Um, so in terms of people, could adding more team members remove a bottleneck? Or could adding in technology improve a manual process? Or actually, could we use stuff that we're familiar with, technologies, languages, um, web, uh, you know, just opportunities basically to do some really cutting edge stuff. So the goal is here that we can champion um, things that we know from our digital work that can bring benefits to do good more widely. And when we talk about ideas like innovation and change, it doesn't have to mean replacing everybody with AI or robots or rolling out virtual worlds with client interactions. There are different degrees that we can go to. Because in Manor's case, we found that there are some really core things um, like lack of visibility of data, informal workarounds were happening, uh, bottlenecks of people, inaccuracies, and lots and lots of spreadsheets, a bit of paper. And you know, even basic data capture could be better. So with this, some very basic web tools can actually bring some huge benefits and do things like remove manual tasks and reduce human error. But then you've got the really exciting things that you can do using you know, sensors, AI, physical integrations. And it's not one or the other. You can do different degrees. So there are these really simple ways to find opportunities for change, to look at the symptoms and to trace everything back using techniques that you might already use. And there's different degrees that you can actually do in terms of going on that journey of change. And I think crucially here, whatever your official role, if you're a developer, you don't just have to deliver. You don't just have to um, you know, work to that scope, do those tasks, and stop there. You can actually help to push on ways of working and other benefits. But how do we make things happen? Okay, well, I'm going to finish up with just a few examples of things I found to be really beneficial. And the first step is to talk about what you found and what you're excited about. Uh, because you need to start getting people on board. You need to bring them on that journey with you. And there's different ways that you can do that. And it might actually be that days like today can help. So you can go back to work, to your company, and say, well, you know, these people that I met or these talks reference this, and I think that it's a really good opportunity. And that kind of works for some people. But for others, the old show don't tell, mom, uh, show, don't tell mentality is the best. And uh, just to pick up the manner story again, um, what I tend to do is on my projects, I have a, a midpoint workshop so that everybody can get together to discuss the findings, the opportunities that we found, and as a group, we can decide on our priorities for the next step. And we did this, and the outcome was to build two really quick prototypes that we could actually then take around the factory um, to validate some ideas that we had, but more importantly, to show people that there were these potential opportunities out there and that we could build things to solve their frustrations. And this is really critical, because when we think about communicating improvements, uh, there can be an important exercise in remembering that uh, we, we shouldn't take things for granted, and there is this power in showing. Because when we talk about making things better with the web, we don't want to forget the basics. And some of the things that people liked with this were things that we would kind of take for granted. So things being available on different devices, uh, being able to take pictures straight from the website, essentially. Uh, you know, really, really dull things like defaulting dates um, or defaulting locations based on the date, geolocation. All of these were kind of practically magic. And when you start getting into things like, you know, offline capabilities, notifications, people look at you like you've just invented something crazy. Um, but you're not, they're all just things that you know about from your day-to-day -day experience of websites that you know can help more widely. And I think that we as a community, we tend to use quite a lot of fancy words, and when you talk about concepts like progressive enhancement or neural nets or progressive web apps, people who don't necessarily come to conferences all the time or who live in a different world where they're just trying to run their business, they don't necessarily know why these things are important to them. And so this is one of the reasons why little standalone demos could be so useful, because it's one thing to actually talk to somebody about uh, progressive web apps, but it's another thing to hand them a device where they can turn off the data, 
they can you know, get notifications, they can work offline, they can add things to the home screen. It's so much more powerful when somebody can engage with it themselves. And another really important factor is to actually set out this ideal of where you want to get to. So whilst you need to be aware of where you are now, um, you can't expect to turn everything around overnight, but you want to get everybody kind of on that journey together with something to aim for. And this is where standards and principles can come in. So since last year, I've been working um, down in the pool with the RNLI, uh, the Royal National Lifeboat Institution, Institution, I'd say. And um, we've basically gone through this big process of speaking to a load of people and iteratively mapping out a, a quite complex view of their ecosystem with technology. Um, but we've gone through some of these uh, processes we've talked about today. So using tools like the expert review, looking at issues, uncovering root issues. And the end result has been to compile these into a set of standards. And what these can do is act as a reference so that everybody can basically work to the same expectations around things like what should we do for testing? Uh, what should we be doing for accessibility? And it can act as a reference point for people internally who may not be so aware of certain subjects or might need a bit more guidance. And so one of the things we talked about, for instance, was technology choice. So why certain technologies are more or less appropriate in different situations and what to look out for. But then when you get all this really valuable information, uh, there's no reason why very often, unless it's particularly sensitive, you can't launch it as a public resource. So what's happened with this is um, they've actually put together a patent library and they're putting up some of those principles and the ways that they work as well. So this can become a statement of who you are, how you work, what your expectations are, and also be a resource for some of the partners that you work with. So you can start with something like this to not only use good standards and good practice internally, but encourage others to start adopting them too and be able to point to you as a beacon of how to do things. But standards are of course just a kind of a reference and a way to make sure that everything's working the same way. Uh, but what doesn't work is just to plonk down a list of rules. So if you've ever tried that with coding standards, you're probably going to get some pushback. Um, people need to understand why they're doing something and how best to do it. And they need to be able to ask questions in a really safe way. So you should try and bring people on that journey again. Try and coach them. Try and explain things as you go along on a project and not just work to an end result. Because change happens both from the outside in and inside out. And it can be really powerful to bring an outsider in to show you all these things, but you've got to get that embedded in your teams. You've got to actually change people's mindsets as well as change through technology. And finally, you should stay open and be prepared to change your direction and potentially compromise. Because sometimes people are set on a particular approach for a reason, and it's quite easy sometimes to fall into that trap of being a little bit arrogant and projecting your best case scenario onto everybody and not listening to their situation. I really love this blog post uh, by Ethan Marcotte where he wrote about his experiences of um, talking to some not-for-profits about their off-the-shelf themes that they were choosing uh, because they didn't have the time or the money for a full redesign so um, they were picking these themes Many of them were slow and heavy and really badly coded and terrible for maintenance. But Ethan found these two common threads. And one is that they didn't know that they necessarily had to care about these things. And two, given the time and resources available, they can't always prioritize these things over other business requirements. So if somebody's work is more important than a website, then no amount of education or showing them the right way is going to help. And you need to sometimes accept that websites aren't as important as these other things, and that maybe those efforts could be focused elsewhere into changing workflows or looking for other opportunities to help the organisation in those ways. So after today, I really hope that you're going to go back to your projects and think about both what you have done and what hasn't been done yet. And think about how websites are really important because they can kind of ground these conversations in reality and give us something tangible to refer to. And we can deal with these actual problems rather than perceived problems. And so by hopefully following some of the things we've talked about today, we can not only make our projects better, but actually think about what else we can do and use our experience to bring change more widely. And this, for me, is the reason that I work in the digital transformation space, because it doesn't have to be a kind of buzzword-laden set of activities. It can be done by people regardless of their role. 
um, we can use all of this uh, power that the web gives us to make things better. So if you want to talk more, um, come and say hi afterwards, or thank you very much. Time for about one or two questions. Uh, we've kind of set the over around, but if there's anyone who's a burning question to ask, the gentleman over there is hand up. Uh, Hi, Dean. So the question was, how do big companies launch rubbish things, basically, <laughs> if I'm condensing that down right? Um, I think that when you're saying there's often a person behind that, how does that happen? I think the problem is there's, in that instance, probably 20, 100 people behind that, all sort of slap each other on the back and thinking how great they are. Um, and I think that the, the challenge is in large organisations, where the time, uh, you know, time and money isn't the problem, that you then get caught up in if you can do everything then you know it's kind of like where to draw the lines and how to run those projects as efficiently as smaller companies and a lot of companies like bigger companies i found you know that they're, they're very jealous because they feel like they're bogged down with the past they've got legacy systems they've got legacy ways of working they've got um, compliance regulation stuff so they kind of you know they get hooked up in all these things <coughs> And they, they look at you know other smaller companies and go, oh, I wish we could do that. And um, it's, it's very difficult to break down. And it, the problem is that it requires not just a shift in technology or process or anything like that, but it's actually kind of, you know, it's a cultural change as well. So um, yeah, big companies make rubbish things too. Thank you, I think we're out of time. So big applause for Sally, thank you for coming. <laughs>